here. Make yourself at home with us this morning. Good to be here. I know of a lot of places I could be, and I'm glad I'm here. Amen. <laughs> I am, believe me. You could be waking up in the drunk tank this morning or intensive care, or they could have your cold body in the morgue. But by the grace of God, we are here, right? Our Father, I give you thanks. I bless your righteous holy name. There's none like unto thee. None. I pray that you'd bless in the service today, that you'd give me wisdom, the gift of teaching. And Father, may these words fall on good ground. In thy name I pray. Amen. All right, turn to the book of Daniel with me this morning. Maligned and hated by the liberals. Because if Daniel is truly a prophet, it blows their theory out of the water. They believe that Daniel was written somewhere probably 100, 150 B.C., long after the fact of these prophecies that we find in here. In other words, it purports to be prophecy, but it's not really prophecy, according to the liberals. Now, they call themselves your brothers and sisters, but they don't believe the Bible. So what in the world they base their faith on is beyond me. But here in Daniel chapter number 2, while Israel was in Babylonian captivity, Babylon, Remember Nimrod's the one who built the kingdom in Shinar, Babylon. It was there that God confounded the languages of mankind. A linguist can trace it all the way back to Babylon. They'll find uh, similarities in languages, but they cannot trace the source of Hebrew. Remember that. Hebrew is a fountainhead in itself. In plain words, it came from You'll hear some of these liberals try to connect it with, uh, Syriac, with Syriac or with uh, Aramaic or with uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, Semitic languages. But the truth of the matter is Hebrew is a language to itself. I believe what Bullinger says about that. So while they are in Babylonian captivity, there is an assault made on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They want to conform them to their gods. So they take Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they change their name to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They change the name of Daniel to Belteshazzar. All of this is worshiping their gods. They want to change their identity. The tactics of Satan haven't changed one bit. You are being assaulted every day of your life to conform to this world by accepting the identity that it puts on you. And we are not of this world. But anyway, in the book of Daniel, God shows him a vision. And he, in the vision, he gives him a prophecy of the succeeding Gentile kingdoms. It's important to remember this now. The vision in Daniel 2 is about Gentile kingdoms, not Jewish, Gentile, Gentile kingdoms. It starts with Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, then it moves to Medo-Persia, uh, Darius, then it goes from there to Greece, Grecia, which would be Alexander the Great. Four horns come up from Alexander when he dies. Uh, Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucid, and Ptolemy. These four horns that come up from, from Grecia or from Alexander the Great spread out over the world at that time and create the kingdoms that are in effect when Christ is born 2,000 years ago. For example, the Seleucids were there, the Ptolemy in North Egypt, and Cassandra, and Lysimachus, and all of this. These were separated and in play, in vogue at the time of Christ 2,000 years ago. Names change over time, but the division was made. And then the last one is the Roman Empire, which is represented by iron. We start with gold, which has the highest specific gravity. We go from there to, to silver, next in line. Then we go from there to, uh, to brass and then from there to iron. What is specific gravity? It's the weight of a material as opposed to the weight of water. You compare it to the weight of water. A gallon of water weighs such and such, then how much does a gallon of gold weigh? Well, it weighs far more than a gallon of water. So we start at the top with the finest metal on this earth in value, representative of deity, and we, di di we, we, go, we, 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 we go down. As we go down, we go down in value, we go down in weight, until we get to the bottom where we have iron and clay. Now think about it, dirt. So we start with gold and we wind up with dirt. 
This is representative of the Gentile kingdoms of this world. It's very important to understand something this morning. Gentiles scratch, claw, kill, uh, rape, pillage, do whatever they can to progress their kingdoms. You know right now that Pompeo, the Secretary of State, has just left North Korea and he's trying to talk to the North Koreans about denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, which would be a good thing. If the whole world was denuked, it would be a good thing, don't you think? Oppenheimer, when he was uh, there at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer said, we got a problem, and I have been part of the problem. We have created a doomsday weapon. And then when they dropped it on Hiroshima, August the 6th, 44, 45 rather, and then they dropped it on Nagasaki three days later, it became readily apparent to people that man had opened Pandora's box. You don't want a nuclear war. Nobody wins. Nobody wins. But anyway, the whole point is this. By brute force, by absolute brute force, one kingdom takes over the next kingdom. So Babylonia, the Babylonians fell to the Persians, the per Medo-Persia. The Medo-Persia fell to the Grecians. The Grecians fell to the Romans. And then in the Romans, you have two legs. You have a split. 1054 A.D., you have the eastern and western branches of the Roman Empire. The eastern branch is what we know today as the Eastern Orthodox Church. Constantine uh, established essentially a city where it well, used to be Byzantium there at the Straits of Bosphora, and there he named it Constantinople. And that became the, that became the head of the eastern branch of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. So what do you mean by that? I mean this, that uh, Constantine was the first Roman emperor to acknowledge Christianity to give them freedom. Now, he's, he's a very controversial figure. A lot of folks send Constantine straight to hell, say he was never a Christian, Fact is, he waited until right before he died to be baptized because he thought baptism was essential for his salvation. I'll leave that to the judge, uh, you know, whether or not Constantine's faith was real or not. But I, knew, I do know this. I do know he convened the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. The purpose of the Council of Nicaea was to combat Arianism, which had showed up in the first couple of centuries after Christ. Say, so what's Arianism? Arianism is a, is a heretical doctrine that teaches that Christ was created. All right? He was created. He, by being created, he is a lesser God. He is not as great as Jehovah. Now, he gets this. Arius got that from Gnosticism. You see, he got it from Gnosticism. But Charles Taz Russell, back in the 1800s, who considered himself a great Bible scholar, uh, studied back into the, into the history of Gnosticism and the history of Arianism. And so he started a Bible study, and today they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm glad they don't call themselves a church, because they have no connection with it whatsoever. So what's a Jehovah's Witness? He's an Arian. What's an Arian? He believes the Lord Jesus Christ is a created God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God in their Bible, but not in your Bible. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was the Almighty. Revelation 1.8, the Almighty. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, so forth. So, in 325 A.D., Constantine established or held the Council of Nicaea to pull together some factions. They were dealing with a lot of heresy in the first century. And they came out with what's called the Nicaean Creed. Constantine broke away from the Western Church. And he moved east. And when he moved east, he founded Constantinople, which stood all the way up until the time that the Ottoman Empire overthrew it. The Ottoman Turks, they overthrew it. They changed that beautiful church that was Hag uh, Hagia Sophia. They changed that church into a Muslim mosque. They do that everywhere, folks. Forget what CBS, NBC, and ABC tells you. They don't know anything. Either they don't or if they know it, they're covering it up. They turned it into a Muslim, Muslim mosque. Now it's a museum. It's, in, it's, it's a huge museum, beautiful place. Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom. The eastern branch of the Roman Empire turned out preachers like, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the... They called him the golden, the golden preacher. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. 
I'm trying to recall off, this is off the top of my head. I'm giving you all this stuff. Uh, I'll remember it in a minute. But anyway, that eastern branch stayed, stayed closer to the truth than the western branch did. What's the western branch? Roman Catholic Church. Rome, Italy. And that's what you have today. Now it comes down to the feet. And when it, when it comes down to the feet, then we have a strange thing that happens. Look at Act, uh, Daniel 2. Verse 43, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. They are who? <laughs> they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity, but en enmity between thee and and the seed of the serpent, between the woman's seed and the seed of the serpent, the seed of Christ. Genesis, I mean, Psalm 22, he shall see his seed. Isaiah 53, his seed, his progeny, those that follow after him. There's the seed of the serpent and there's the seed of the woman. That's for a different time. But I want you to put that in the back of your mind right now. The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And here plainly he says that they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. A supernatural intervention. And we're having it, folks. Big time. I got an email from a young lady just the other day. And she said, when I was, when I was uh, young, I gathered together with some kids. And you know how kids are. They explore and they, they, they do everything. She said, we got around in a circle and we put our fingers underneath a body. And we could lift that whole body off of it. She said, it happened, preacher. She said, I don't care what you've read, who said this or that. She said, I was there. My body was lifted right off the floor with nothing more than fingers. I was reading a preacher the other day. He said, he said I got sick. He said, I had cancer. He said, the doctor, the doctor diagnosed cancer. I think he said it was of his liver. He said he asked the church to pray for him. The church said, we will pray for you because you're sick. You've got cancer. So the church prayed for him. Then he said that there was a meeting that some young man came to him and said, Brother, do you care if I come to your study or to your home and lay hands on you and pray for you? He said, you certainly can. And so he came and he laid hands on him and he prayed for him. And while he was praying for him, he said, this preacher now, he said, this preacher, this preacher said, this thing started coming out of my mouth and he said, I could just, all I could do was roar ah, for I don't know how long. And this thing left him. And when he went back to the doctor, his cancer was gone. Now, if you're a good old liberal or a good old conservative Christian out the door with that, that's just a bunch of foolishness. You don't believe that. You believe when the canon of Scripture was closed, all the miracles ceased. You don't believe, uh, you don't believe any of that stuff today, but I do. Amen. I do. Because I've had too many dealings with the devil. I've had too many dealings with demons. I believe it. You'll never tell me otherwise. I know what an evil spirit is. And so this happens. Now, of course, when stuff like this happens, what does it do to the liberal? Well, he goes screaming mad. Why? Because he can't put it under his microscope. He doesn't have any books to tell him what it's about. It doesn't belong in, 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 his, in, his, uh, in his sociology classes at UT or UK or anywhere else. And so he's completely devoid of any understanding at all. And listen, the world operates on the principle of ego. Ego. Mm -hmm. Ego, I me, is the Greek for emphatic saying, I am me. So we just take the ego out of Greek and transliterate it straight into English, and it's ego. What is ego? It's the you. It's the selfie generation. I'm wonderful. Look how beautiful I am. I spend my days looking at myself. My, how it inspires me to see me. <laughs> you know, I'll allow you the privilege of being in my presence for a little while. Aren't I beautiful and wonderful? Smartest thing in the world? That's where we are today. All right? The ego. But here's the problem. When a fellow hangs his degrees on the wall and none of his degrees cover what you're talking about, he'll build his defenses. 
And he'll throw them up and he'll just pass you off as a nutball or a nutcase or ignorant or whatever. Why? Because that's something he doesn't know. And folks, as I said to you before, there's nothing you can do for stupid, but you can educate ignorant. And we're all ignorant. Nobody knows it all. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> so that's what you're in. That's, that's the problem. And that's what you're dealing with. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Yeah. So we need to watch that because it happened before in Genesis 6. And uh, what happened in Genesis 6, Peter told you, the angels that kept not their first estate, he's reserved in Tartarus, Tartarao, the lowest hell. That's down below Hades. Yeah, the lowest hell. They've been reserved in chains in Tartarus. So what do you mean? They left their first estate. They came down to the daughters of men. They cohabited with them. Giants were born. The giants were called men of renown. We have record of giants all over the world. We're inundated with it. It's in every civilization practically. It's everywhere. Giants, giants, giants. We have our military, our troops. Let me tell you something. If I take a soldier and a politician, which one do you think I'm going to believe? I'll believe that soldier in a heartbeat over a politician. And that's not all politicians aren't bad, but, <laughs> but anyway, they in Kandahar, Afghanistan, our troops came face to face with a giant. A giant. No question about it. And it's, it's on YouTube. All you got to do is type it in, do some research into it. But wait a minute, Darwin. Hold on. That doesn't fit either. No, wait, 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 wait. That can't work. I mean, how do we explain the giants? See, anything that gets out of Darwin and his Mickey Mouse garbage that's taught as fact in the, in the school system, then once you, once you get away from Darwin, then immediately you are demonized. That's what's happening. But the giants are real, folks. Believe me, they are very, very real. So they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. These did. Angels, giants, before the flood, after the flood, giants are in the earth. They passed one giant family, tried to kill David. Giants are here. They have been, they are now, and they will be until the second advent of Christ. So we live in a supernatural age. Unlike anything I have seen in my lifetime, I've been here a while, but I have never seen a whole country literally go bonkers like the United States has gone. We've gone belly up when it comes to spiritual things. And it's sad. It's sad. It's so sad. So what do you do? You look for the coming of the Lord because Gentile kingdoms have to overthrow each other. So what finishes off this image in Daniel chapter number 2. What finishes it off? A what now? A stone cut out of a mountain smites the image on its head and knocks it over. I'm wrong, right? Where does it hit it? Hits it on its feet. Its foundation. And when it hits it on its feet, smites it on its feet, its destruction is absolute, complete, and immediate. Down it comes. And to a pile, and it's finished. And the reason it is, is because there is a kingdom that that rock represents. And that kingdom that that rock represents is by far greater than the kingdoms of this world. But notice, the kingdom of Christ is not being built on this earth, one block, one brick at a time, to counter this kingdom of Daniel chapter number 2, this image of 606 B.C. down to the present. This kingdom comes. It comes catastrophically. It comes immediately. It comes and it goes. Where does it go? It's straight, straight to, the, to, the, to the foundation of the Gentile kingdoms. It uproots them. It turns them upside down. And when it comes, it of course is Christ. He's our stone. He's the stone the builders rejected. He's the foundation stone. The stone that Moses made the big mistake of smiting the second time. And when it smites that image on its feet, down it comes. But when Christ comes, He brings His kingdom with Him. And then Revelation 11 says, The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. When? Not by the church building His kingdom. 
People have tried communism. They have tried socialism. They have tried Nazism, which was the German Socialist Party. They have tried fascism under Mussolini. They have tried capitalism. That's what you're living under. If you ask the average American on the street, now please tell me, what's the difference between capitalism and fascism? What do you think you'd get as an answer? What is the difference? Did you know that most people, folks, most people couldn't care less what kind of government they've got? I doubt if most Americans even know that there's three branches and that right now that a Supreme Court justice is going to be picked and announced this coming Monday night, which will have a profound effect upon this nation going into the future. Amen. Profound effect. But as long as they've got their six-pack and their sex, as long as they've got, they're happy, they're, they're comfortable, as long as they've got food on the table and they can buy whatever they want and they've got jobs and this and that, I don't care what kind of government's running. They couldn't care less. It took me 50 years to learn that. They really did. When I say learn it, I mean got it in my heart. They don't care. If a Russian is happy under, and it's not, you know, communism didn't work too good in Russia. And they're still working on it in, 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 in China. But there's a, Chinese are completely different people from the Russians. One are Slavs and the other are Chinese. They're Oriental. They're different people. See, you, see I'm already, I'm already, you, you, Oriental. Did you use that word, Oriental? <laughs> ha! Did you say Oriental? I'm going to call the thought police on you. See what's happening? See what's, see what's happening, folks? You're afraid to let your mind think and just let the words come out and speak what's on your heart. You're scared to death to. Because they're going to brand you. Why? They are controlling your speech. Your freedom of speech is gone. And I'm too far gone. The country I was born into in 1946, there was freedom of speech. You might not agree with it, but you had the freedom to say it. Sure, you've got bigotry. Sure, you've got uh, racism. Sure, you've got all of this stuff. Absolutely. But folks, you have a group of elitists in this country that are defining terms. And they completely, up ch they completely change the meaning of a term and then brand you with it to control you. And we're letting them do it. That's exactly right. That's what's happening. So communism failed in China. It'll fail in China. It failed in Russia. And in Russia now, there, there's a different system set up. It's kind of a, it's kind of a capitalistic. You've got billionaires in Russia. You know that, don't you? Billionaires. Fascism, Mussolini did not own the production of goods, but he controlled it. That's fascism. Communism, you own the production of goods. Socialism, you take everything that's made and distribute it <laughs> the way you want to. Capitalism... It's supposed to operate under the principle that you have the capital, you have the business, you have the money, you hire the workers. And because of the prosperity that's produced by that, the country prospers and on it goes. Capitalism is not perfect. No system made by man is perfect. But I've looked at all of them, and I'd rather have this one than any of the rest of them. How about you? You want to move to Red China? <laughs> How about trying Mussolini for a while? No, no. Stick with this one. It seems to work pretty good. The greatest government on the face of this earth is not a parliament. And Great Britain's got a parliament, a House of Lords, a House of Commons. You know, they deal with it. Israel's got a Knesset. They've got a, what's called a bicameral government. All right? You've got, you've got, you've got governments here where they, where they debate and they deal with the issues, like the United States. We've got a House. We've got, we've got a Senate. Six years they are in office. We've got a House. Every two years it changes. The House of the people. All right? That's the legislative branch. Then we have an executive branch who's supposed to administer the laws. He's supposed to run the country. Then we have, a, we have, a, we have a, the Supreme Court. We have that branch where they, where they literally interpret the laws of the land. It doesn't always work. But it's the best thing I've seen so far. But the best government by far, best by far, is a monarchy. Hold on, preacher. What do you mean a monarchy? 
if the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and He's sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, I'll march to His tune any day of the week. I'll be happy with Him as the King. <laughs> but you see, the problem with a monarchy is if you get the wrong monarch, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, if you get somebody like that in there, you're in trouble. <laughs> that's a problem. But that's not who we have. We have the Lord Jesus coming back with a monarchy. And when He comes, He doesn't come. To a parliament, he doesn't come to a congress like this. He doesn't come to a Knesset. He brings his kingdom with him. And he rules with a rod of iron on this earth for a thousand years. I mean, never heard any of that. <laughs> Some folks look at me like, good night. Where'd this, where'd this, <laughs> where'd this crazy man come from? <laughs> uh I read a lot. I observe. Believe me. Both branches of government, Republican and Democrat, most of them are as corrupt as they can be. They are. They're corrupt to the bone. They are. How in the world this country has survived is beyond me. The hand of God is the only thing I can attribute it to. Amen. You're trying to get rid of this Roe versus Wade. And we've got Republican senators coming out against a Supreme Court pick. Republican senators coming out against picking a justice that will overthrow Roe versus Wade. So what's Roe versus Wade? Norma McCorvey against Wade, the Supreme Court. When was it? 73, 74, 72, 71, somewhere in there. Handed down this monstrous decision that you could kill the unborn then they created terms like a woman has a right over her body the right abortion rights you might as well say murder rights what gives anybody the right to kill their baby I marvel at that but it's accepted as fact now why? because nine people up there in the, uh, in the Supreme Court, passed a decision like that down. So, do we need an end to Gentile rule? <laughs> Don't you think it's time for a Jewish Messiah to come back and bring some sanity to this crazy world? Yes, sir, I do. I do. With all of my heart, I do. I'm looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when He comes, He comes and smite the image on its feet. My watch fell off this morning. You wouldn't believe it. I put my coat on back here, had my watch on, and jumped right off my arm. I looked at it, and the strap had come loose, worn out, falling apart. So I don't know what time it is. Anybody? It, well, we, we, don't, <laughs> we don't stay here all day. We, what do you got, brother? Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Is that Greenwich Mean Time? All right, brother. Universal coordinated, they call it now. UCT. 1028. All right, so it smites the image on its feet. It comes tumbling down. The church, the western branch, set about to build the kingdom of God on this earth. How they do it? They do it by taking the Sermon on the Mount. All right? They do it by taking the Sermon on the Mount, <coughs> using it as the constitution for the kingdom. The constitution is the supreme law of the land. All right. So they set about to build the kingdom of God on earth. Why do they do that? Because they have a priesthood. They want to exercise temporal authority. They sit in basilias or basilicas, which is the Greek word for a king. And they sit there and they speak ex cathedra from that seat and they rule over the kingdoms of the world. The Jesuits, and you understand, the Jesuits have a God-given right to lie to you, say anything they please to you to further their agenda, just exactly as the Muslim has taqiyya, where he can say whatever he pleases and lies. The Jesuits went into Japan. Japan was closed to the world. The, Japan had a feudal system of samurai, shoguns, all of that, constantly fighting each other. 
Japan was a was a was a violent country. The Jesuits go in there. They begin to convert men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ, supposedly. But what they did was go in there and try to overthrow the Japanese government, or the, these these you know they didn't have a centralized government. These 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 fighting these warlords and establish a Christian government in Japan. Japanese saw what was happening, and they expelled them from their country. They kicked them out. Do you know why? Because the Japanese are some of the smartest people in the world. How do you know that? They bombed them into oblivion in World War II. And now most of the cars that you're driving on the road are made in Japan. They rose from the ashes and rebuilt. Why? The people of Japan are different. If you try to go to Japan and start building Muslim mosques, do you know what they'll do? Uh, they'll shut you down and they'll get you out of that country. You know why? They're going to say to you face to face, we love our culture and we're going to keep our culture just like it is. CBS, NBC, ABC, and the rest of them didn't tell you that. See, they didn't tell you that. They're not going to tell you that because it doesn't fit the agenda. So when we have the kingdoms of this world, Gentile kingdoms, tearing, pushing, doing whatever they can to tear each other down, we're coming down to the end. We're at the point now where all it takes is one nut job to push the wrong button and we're in trouble. We're in trouble. What if this guy in North Korea launches a, an atomic weapon on South Korea? We've got 38,000 troops over there. At the, what is it, the 28th parallel? 30th parallel? We've got 28,000 troops right there. And there's something, I forget how many millions are in Seoul, which is just a few miles on further south. We've got all those troops over there. And what if they what if what if he pushes the button and sends a nuke down there on top of those men? Then we've got a war, folks. And we've got a war like this world's never seen before. Like it's never seen. Say, so, well, we just go up there and destroy North Korea. What about China? China's not going to sit there and let you destroy North Korea. North Korea is a buffer. They've got their hegemony that I'll tell you about last week. What's hegemony? Hegemony is the spreading of a nation's power throughout an influence throughout the world. It's not an empire, but it can look like one. This is why the communists all the time are talking about imperialism, imperialism, imperialism. That's all you hear out of them. Back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, imperialism, imperialism. What does that mean? That means that they're, they're, they're trying to say to you, the Russians are trying to say to the Americans, you're trying to spread your influence and create an empire. You know, that's what's going on. So this business of pushing a button and destroying North Korea is not that simple. It's not that simple because a bunch of people are going to die. And it could easily spread, spread so quickly. What if Iran has already got a nuclear weapon? And what if Iran seizes the opportunity to send a missile over to Israel? Israel has what's called the Samson option. There's no question that Israel is loaded, loaded to the teeth with nuclear weapons. They want everybody over there to understand, you may take us down, but you're going to be, there's going to be nothing left with you. You know, we're going to burn you to a crisp. And they've got the technology to do it. But then what? You see what I mean? It can spread. What was Russia do? What would, the, what would France do? France has nuclear weapons. Great Britain's got nuclear weapons. What would they do? If the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't come back soon, we are sitting on a tinderbox. That's going to explode underneath us. Do you know how many people right now are talking about a civil war in America? Have you noticed the news media in the last few months been fanning the flames of a civil war in this country? Have you noticed when Maxine Waters got up and said you need to go and you need to demonstrate, you need to speak against them, you don't let them go into a, a restaurant and sit down and eat in peace? That's inciting violence. It's inciting violence. And the news media, what do they do? 
They try to present this thing from the viewpoint, well, you know, the Republicans are, this Republican president, he's a bully, and he's just shoving this stuff down the throats of the people, and he's bringing this on and this and that. Why don't people calm down? Why don't Americans, why can't we have a dialogue with each other? You mean how many times I've, do you know what the, 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 uh, what do they call the Agora? There's two Agoras. There's the Agora over there in India, and you wouldn't believe if you type that word in and Google it, what an Agora looks like in India. It'll blow your mind. But it's also the marketplace in Greek culture. It was a place where you could stand up and debate. I'm not afraid of debate, are you? They won't let you debate Darwin. They said the debate's over. When did it when when was it over? They won't let you debate immigration. The news media, the Democrats in the news media right now are trying to get rid of ICE. That's a law enforcement agency. That would be like somebody standing, let's get rid of the sheriff of Knox County. <laughs> or the chief of police and be done with the police. That's a legitimate law enforcement agency. What do you think that's doing to people? Do they want America to fall? What do you think a civil war would produce in this country? I would guess this morning that probably 70% of the veterans in America are conservative. I get a magazine about once every two or three weeks. It's called Military. And the column in that military, the retired officers and the enlisted, they're constantly they're, they're conservative. That's what they are. 70%, probably 80% of the veterans in this country are conservative. Whose side do you think they take? When a news media doesn't know the difference between a 50 caliber and a BB gun. I remember at Waco, I remember one of the, one of the news announcers. I remember her, I'll never forget this. She held up a 50 caliber round. 700 grain, 50 caliber, about like this. I don't remember exactly how long they are. Do you know what a 50 caliber round will do? It'll come in that wall, go out that wall, and keep going. It's made for anti, it, it was designed not for anti-personnel, but for anti-armor, uh, equipment, jeeps, and, and so forth. She said, this is what they're shooting at the, at the police with from inside this compound. No, it was not. That should have been a wake-up call for anybody. Yeah. Say, so what do you mean? If they were shooting 50 caliber armor-piercing ammo at the police that were hiding behind jeeps and this and that, they would have killed every one of them. Yeah. You can't hide behind a jeep from a 50 caliber. No. You see what I mean? They lied. Yeah. So what's the news media lying for? What are they trying to do to this country? I don't want a civil war. Do you? Good night, man. I mean, that's insanity. But it's constant fighting, 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 fighting until the Prince of Peace comes and he brings peace with him and there will be no peace. So he smites the image on its feet and it comes tumbling down and the Gentile kingdoms are finished. Amen. So what's the difference then, preacher, between the, the Western branch who, who, who constantly preaches the Sermon on the Mount, who's building the kingdom on this, on this earth, and us? It's this. The Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But he says plainly, for you to occupy till he comes. It is not our place to build a kingdom. Our place is to look for the coming of the king. And to call a Gentile bride out of this world that you find over there in the book of Genesis. When Abraham sent his servant Eleazar back to his home to get a bride for Isaac. That's what he's doing. He's calling a Gentile or Jew, Jews saved too, bride out of this world. Because we're not of this world. And he's told Pontius Pilate. He said, Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. You look up that word world, it's translated word, it's cosmos, it's not ion. Ion is age. 
He's literally saying, my kingdom is not of this official system, this earth, and what's going on here right now with the dogfight. My kingdom is not part of this. That's what he said to him. And his kingdom will come when he comes. Amen. That takes a great, that gives you a perspective on what you're here for. So what are we here for, preacher? Preach the gospel. Amen. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. The Great Commission. Tell them about Christ. He'll build his church. Matthew 16, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. He didn't say I'd build my kingdom here now. He didn't say I'd build governments. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what he's doing. Who's his church? You know who he is. Do you know him? If you know him, you know who the church is. Amen. You ever been around a bunch of religious people that are very zealous about it, but you felt no spirit witness? None whatsoever? I mean, it was dead as it could be. The reason for that is because they're not your brothers and sisters in Christ. They don't belong to the Lord. Once you've been born again, you have the witness of the Holy Spirit in you. He witnesses in you. He witnesses to the people that you're around. Amen. All right. Anybody have a question? We've got about three or four minutes, and then we'll close. But anything I covered? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, question. In our generation, uh, we were taught, I'm sure you was, all of us in here, the schools and things like that, that the Bible was I agree with that. That's that's the view cycles, uh, governments, uh, people, uh, society goes through cycles. Right now, we're in the downward cycle of complacency, fat and happy, and uh, that's where the people are today. They're not uncomfortable. Once they get uncomfortable, then they start looking for for a, an exit for it. That's why it said in the book of Exodus when they made the people uncomfortable. They started making bricks and they took the straw away from them. They cried out to God by reason of their afflictions. That's, that's the problem. That's where we stand right now. People, they don't need God. They're happy. They're happy. Yeah, prosperity and the, and the jobs are coming. It looks to me like the, the policies of Donald Trump are, are working. We've got more people in this country now that want to give you a job than we've got people who can... Occupy that job. I saw a thing yesterday. It's blow your mind. Now, you may find this hard to believe. There's a man in this country who is offering. He wants automotive technicians so bad, he's willing to pay $120,000 a year. Now, there's a lot of four-year college graduates out here that would be happy to get a $45,000 a year job. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> $120,000 a year for an automotive technician. That's the guy who runs the scope and does all the rest of that. He's the guy that diagnoses your problems and then sometimes turns it over to another mechanic to fix it. And that's very important. Uh, very important. You take it to somebody who knows what he's doing because this stuff today is so high tech. They've taken the shade tree out. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Those days are past. You've got to be working on 50s and 60s and 70s stuff. For shade tree. <laughs> I remember when I worked at Vanslack, they sent me to school up here in Lanham, Maryland. I learned how to use the oscilloscope. The scope. And back then it was about that big. You wouldn't believe how huge that was in 1970. You could see the engine fire. You could see that firing line. Just like a scope that's used over here in the hospitals. It told you when the plug fired. It told you how much power it took to fire it. It told you when the points opened. It took took. It tells you how wide the gap is. It tells you how much the condenser was holding back on the fire, and when it and, and each one of them. It told you how close each cylinder was to the other one. All of that by just looking at an oscilloscope. That was the beginning of the tech that they're using today. That's what it is. So I encourage you in here this morning. If you want to get a, if you want to, if you want to get into something that you can make a little money at, get you a toolbox. <laughs> Forget the school. Get you a toolbox. Get you. Don't buy Snap-on. I bought it back in the seventies. I could. You could afford it back then. You can't afford Snap-on now. It's out of out of hand. Get you a toolbox. 
Learn what this stuff, what makes these things tick, and you'll make a good living. You'll make a good living. You sure will. Amen. All right. How in the world are we getting into... <laughs> fixing cars? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's have word of prayer and we'll let you go.